our political leaders still tell us that we have to reduce our dangerous dependency on imported oil and of course uh, and imported gasoline which is substantially also coming into the country. But the reality is in the last five years our energy situation has been transformed. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, reducing pain at the pump, the need for a solid energy policy. As prices at the pump continue to climb and the nation's need for fossil fuel continues to grow, the plea for sustainable and affordable energy sources gets louder. And to answer the cry, we need to turn to natural gas, new ways of extracting oil, and a smart, comprehensive energy policy, states senior fellow Charlie Ebinger. So Charlie, what is our situation with natural gas and oil? Are we in dire straits? We fundamentally see a situation where the United States and Canada, or North America, also in Mexico, where there's some promising developments, where the Western Hemisphere can be energy independent and never have to buy another drop of oil from the Middle East. This is a staggering change. You talk a lot about the advances in extracting natural gas with a process called fracking. And this also has possible uses in extracting oil from shale rock, is that right? We have, for example, we're using a new technology that allows us to crack uh, rock that has natural gas in it, technology called fracking. We have turned a natural gas situation entirely around. Just a few years ago, we were predicting that we would be importing 40% of our natural gas within a decade. Now, we're never going to import natural gas within the foreseeable 70 or 80 years, and the import facilities we built to get ready to import that gas are now applying to become export facilities of natural gas. Likewise, the same technology that we developed to frack and get gas out of the rock is now being used to get oil out of shale rock, uh, shale oil rock. And this has led to a situation where for the last 30 to 40 years, we've inexorably seen our domestic production, oil production falling. Now we are going to see it increase and increase with a bang. We are estimating that within a decade, we will be imp uh, producing another 3 million barrels a day. We produce roughly 9 million barrels a day. We will go up to 12. In Canada, an area where they have something called uh, oil sands, which is really more a mining operation because you get the oil out of, out of the earth more than you do as a drilling, uh, we're going to see another 3 million barrels a day in a decade. And Canada doesn't need that energy, so it's going to come to the United States. You write frequently about natural gas or liquefied natural gas. Is there any possibility that this could uh, replace our need for petrol? Most of the natural gas in this country is used in power generation uh, to generate electricity, or it's used directly uh, uh, as a fuel in your home for heating and cooling. Uh, where natural gas could make its best penetration t in terms of a growing market would be uh, to replace uh, old coal-fired power plants that in some cases are 50 to 80 years old, highly polluting, and natural gas, if we closed those plants and built new plants using natural gas, the carbon dioxide emissions reductions would be quite substantial. Now, they won't go away because natural gas is a fossil fuel and it releases carbon dioxide, but only about 40% as much as a similar uh, volume of coal. Uh, the other area where it's, the potential is tremendous is in the transportation sector, and particularly in the area of heavy-duty trucks, what we call the 18-wheelers because if we could convert all those trucks, which usually run on diesel fuel, which is of course a petroleum-based fuel and uh, a lot of it is imported, uh, if we could replace all those trucks, we could probably reduce another million and a half to two million barrels a day of imported oil, according to a recent study by Resources for the Future. And that would save billions, tens of billions of dollars on our oil import bill. We would keep that money in America which would then be available for other pressing social needs, and it would be a, a tremendous benefit. Every energy source, whether it's gas, oil, wind, solar, even nuclear, gets some sort of subsidies uh, from the government. Would we be better off without these subsidies? Are they really needed? It's not the Exxons and the Shells and the BPs. It's the small independent companies, some of which are big companies 
in their own right. What some of these benefits do from the taxation standpoint is they allow an acceleration of the write-off of the wealth costs. So we have accelerated depreciation, uh, we have production decline, tax credits. The purpose of all these, you can discuss them all, but the purpose of all these is to improve the cash flow and the independence so they can go drill the next well. If you cut this off, it's not, it's not the dire case that the American Petroleum Institute might say that will be the demise of the domestic industry. But it will certainly lead to fewer wells being drilled and attendantly <clears throat> probably less oil and gas production uh, and as a consequence more imports. And what about energy security? If we lessen our need on fossil fuels, would we have a more secure nation? As one who's written about energy security, I must say I, I have to reassess some of my own writings because even today most of our oil doesn't come from politically volatile countries. You know, our single biggest supplier of oil is Canada to the north, you know, that those dangerous Canadians that we need to worry about, and from Mexico to the south. Venezuela, of course, nobody likes Mr. Chavez, but the reality is he sells his oil to the United States. He's never cut it off. Uh, and so uh, we're really only getting about 13% of our oil right now from the Middle East, and particularly the Persian Gulf. So yes, the events I talked about will certainly change that, but the U.S. will still be vulnerable if there's a disruption elsewhere in the world. But it'll be a financial disruption. It won't be the kind of physical supply curtailments we saw back in 73 and again in 79. So what's the best energy policy for the nation? We need to have an energy policy that has at least a central enough agreement across the political aisle that it doesn't change every four years. Because the reality of energy is that it takes many years to develop. And if you keep having tax credits supporting an industry here for this administration, but gone the next administration, you know, the people building these plants are, are planning over the lifetime of those, and they can't have that kind of uncertainty and have any kind of continuity. This is particularly true as we look towards some of the newer renewable sources, uh, because as infant industries, they you can justify giving them some tax rate support in the early years, but if it vanishes right after the industry begins to take off and you've lost all the investment that you've made, and that's tragic and we've done that far too many times. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your Blackberry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.